good morning, everyone. Um, and sorry for uh, starting a few minutes late. We had some technical problems with some panelists uh, uh, having, you know, not being able to log in. But anyway, uh, I'm very uh, happy to welcome you to today's uh, webinar, where we're going to take the temperature on the startup and the VC industry and what's happened since the COVID crisis and what's happening now and uh, what can we expect uh, for the future. My name is Per Stromberg. I'm a professor of finance and private equity here at the uh, Stockholm School of Economics and Swedish House of Finance. And um, I'm not going to be long-winded. I want to get into the discussion. So let me go directly to present uh, our panelists. I'm um, very happy to have four really knowledgeable and, uh, and prominent um, people in the VC and startup um, industry um, with somewhat different perspectives, uh, as we uh, will see. So first, uh, I want to welcome, welcome uh, uh, Olga Beckfries. Um, she's the CEO and co-founder of um, a company called Pocket Law, which is, um, if I understand it correctly, digitizing uh, the legal industry uh, and uh, so on. So it's really uh, good to have you here, um, you. working in the trenches uh, in the startup at the moment. Um, then um, we have Stefan Helgeson. Um, Stefan um, was one of the uh, uh, co-founders um, and is a partner at uh, Sweden's, uh, I would say, best known VC firm or one of the best known VC firms we have here, um, Creandum. Um, and uh, you have a long experience um, in, in uh, the venture, as a venture capitalist, as an investor, uh, and in the startup uh, field uh, generally. Been through a couple of crises by now, so it's going to be interesting to hear your perspectives on this one. Then um, we have Natalia Ilmark. Um, Natalia is a senior investment manager at, um, at Scandia. Um, and Scandia, as you may know, is one of the biggest um, investors in venture capital um, funds has been for quite some time as one of the biggest programs invested in venture capital among all uh, institutional investors. Um, and uh, Scandia is, has investments uh, in, in venture capital funds all over the world. Um, so she will, I'm very much looking forward to hear Natalia's uh, perspective from the investor side, uh, from the LP side uh, on what's happening. And last but not least, I'm uh, very happy to have Hampus uh, call in here from the south of Sweden, I presume. Um, Hampus uh, is, uh, has a, an incredibly long CV that I don't have time to go through all of it, but uh, you've founded companies, uh, you've been uh, an investor in companies, you sit on many, many boards. It's currently now you're focusing on uh, understanding invest, you know, environmental and uh, sustainable investment. Um, so um, thank you everyone uh, for being here. Now, um, let me uh, uh, just start with um, asking you, uh, in turn, how, um, how things have been <laughs> since, since, this, uh, since early March, you know, what your experiences have been. And I'm going to start with Olga, um, you know, running a, a, a startup and then having the COVID crisis hit you. Um, could you maybe shortly just describe how the experience has been and the phases you've gone through uh, since then. Absolutely. So um, it's been a, a very interesting couple of weeks. Um, when the crisis uh, kind of, I guess, hit Stockholm uh, on March 12th, uh, we were uh, deep in our uh, current seed funding round uh, and were basically uh, just about to to close our seed funding round, and uh, suddenly uh, we had to uh, postpone all meetings with different type of investors because they both uh, both private investors and institutional investors that we were uh, in discussions with had to basically focus on other stuff. So uh, we obviously got quite worried and uh, just felt what what's going on, what's happening with the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But we, um, we, we took a step back and uh, we, we let these different type of investors to focus on 
on the companies that they'd already invested in. Um, wow. And um, as you say in Swedish, we had some ice in our stomachs. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but actually after a couple of weeks, after two to three weeks, we, we saw a change in, in both mindset and uh, we saw that this uh, a bit panic that happened uh, in the beginning of March kind of, uh, it went a bit back to normal. So we, um, we, we regained our conversations with all investors and then luckily we were actually able to, to close our seed funding round uh, by oh, okay. the beginning of April. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but how so, was it in the company then? Uh, I guess you, you needed the money, I presume. <laughs> we needed the money, but we actually, we were quite, uh, we had some, some leeway and we were quite, we were doing this financing round uh, quite a couple of months before we would uh, run out of uh, cash. So, uh, which is, I mean, just a, a lesson for all startups, start early, yeah. don't do it yeah. in the last couple of months of, of runway. So we did have six to eight months of, uh, of uh, runway left. So we weren't yeah. stressed in that type of uh, way, but, yeah. um, but we did see it was still a very it, it was a time of, of worry because we did see a couple of other peers um who didn't manage to get investments yeah. or close to investments yeah. um but i have to say we started off actually we, we started off saying let's you know let's do two weeks of working remotely and not being in the office <laughs> and see how yeah. things develop we didn't we, we couldn't foresee that the right. length of this crisis yeah. and no one in the team really could yeah. um, but, right. but we and, were instead in terms... of focusing on our on our invest uh, on our financing round we yeah. were rather focusing on sales because we saw this opportunity given that we have pocket lawyers a digital in-house lawyer and we were selling a digital product which we felt were actually being more relevant than ever in in this type of uh, yeah. crisis you know being both digital and more cost efficient than the traditional yeah. solutions so yeah. we were rather focusing on on doing more sales pushes yeah. so is it your feeling by the way that a lot of uh, of companies like your customers i guess are are law firms and the like uh, or is it more regular it's actually more companies so uh but did so did you did you feel that the uh, companies actually felt that okay we now need to invest a lot quickly in digitizing ourselves uh no I mean, that actually yeah so i think i mean this is our first we, we just launched our platform in in february so perfect timing yeah. with the covid crisis uh so we, we don't really have a period to compare it with but right. we have to say that uh i mean the response to our product and our offering has been overwhelmingly positive and we didn't we didn't yeah. expect this this amazing response uh, yeah, which we yeah. think is because i mean legal is something you need um you still need legal even though yeah, and, and yeah. especially in times like this when you need yeah, to address yeah. uh, questions around employment for example yeah. uh, so we actually tailored the product as well to the new type of demand that was created oh. from the crisis oh. guidance and uh, documentations yeah. so you could actually act on the different type of measurements that were set in place yeah. by the government so we tailored our product. We did like a quite a we pivot a bit when it came to, to content and created yeah. new content that was relevant for this situation. Um, yeah. And then we saw that we could help we could help quite a quite a lot of companies because legal, as I said, it, it's something you still need to address despite it being right. a crisis. And then if you if you are offering a digital solution which is uh, more cost efficient, I guess yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It felt yeah. quite relevant, but. Uh, so answering your question, what the difference I think has been though in, in, the, in the time, uh, in the length of decision making, yeah. I think companies have, have been a bit more hesitant to right. spend money even though it's, it's a small amount of money. Right. Um, right. We can buy a few Zoom licenses, but then <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, I want to turn to uh, Hampus. So you're, um, uh, I guess, one step uh, more to the investor side, but you uh, um, are work as sort of an angel investor, I guess, and uh, in, in several companies. Um, 
when you've been um, and you're on the board of several several uh, um, relatively newly started companies, what's your uh, feeling? What's going on in your uh, in your portfolio or your investment uh, companies or boards right now? Yeah, I, I would say that. I mean, I do angel to seed, so like actually yeah. more more actually late angel. But I would say yeah. what I've found is that the angel scene um, that completely died very quickly. I think that it died because of many reasons. I think it died because, I mean, per, first, as Olga said, that people actually need to tend their own houses. And then the other thing is like just fear. But I think I see, especially with my kind of friends and sort of colleagues, so to say, in San Francisco, I also feel like there was also a shift in status that it used to be that there was, it was like cool to be writing checks here and there. And suddenly there was a while where it wasn't very cool to write checks, it was more cool to kind of build your bunker. Um, mm. And I think it's like we shouldn't underestimate the status thing about being an angel as well. Is that it's not right. only completely economical; it's also part of that. And I think that in this, and then and in the seed stage market, I think where I'm more, more active, I think that what we've seen is there is that there was like the everything dropped, of course. But then I think the market has shifted from panic to like how long would it last? I think we've set yeah. into the normal, and I feel like seed stage funding is getting up again. Um, yeah. Like we'll hear definitely more from staff and I think later stage as well because of course I don't do A rounds and later things but I think that right. my feeling is that seed stage is almost up again and I think the biggest difference is that I think that it's sector by sector. So yeah, I think yeah. that certain sectors are just completely nobody want to touch it. Um, so what would that be? I mean tourism, service industry, um, I mean restaurants, anything which is, I mean a software company that builds cloud kitchens to deliver to restaurants is something that most people right. are just very sort of wary of right now. Right. Um, or you know online booking of travel or anything is also right. of course something that most investors are just um, right. But then I think that on, I think as Olga said as well, I think I've seen a massive boost in digitalization companies. I think uh -huh. that there's a lot of investors, seed stage investors, I think have been taking bolder bets in uh -huh. that, um, digitalizing conferences and events, a lot of things that people suddenly now believe. Um, uh -huh. So I think that, I mean, joking aside, but I think that some investors, I kind of feel that we've been catapulted into the future a bit. I think that yeah. I think everybody has suddenly had to work as if it's 50 years ahead. And I think that's had allowed people to see that. I, I believe that, yeah. you know, in five years, that COVID being gone or something, I yeah. believe that 20 to 40% of time will be spent uh, remote. I think the remote yeah. work and it's now suddenly a normal thing. And it used to be a quite absurd thing. Yeah. Um, so are there actually sort of, uh, yeah. sorry. No, I was just going to say the craziest thing is I have a friend who's a trader, like literal, yeah. like, you know, commodities trader, and he was allowed to work from home six weeks ago. And he said, I never, because I mean, with, when you're a trader and like with terminals and Bloomberg terminals, like you cannot work right. from home. And he said right. six weeks ago, they were just like, okay, work from home. And he said, now I'm never going to leave my house. He said, like, this is the yeah. best thing ever happened to me. Yeah. I get to meet my kids and I get to do yeah. this much better. Um, yeah. So, so if you, but I guess on the, the, you're on the board of a couple of, uh, yeah. of companies, maybe invested in what was um the feeling of the the management teams and the uh, in those companies and and uh, what did you sort of was there anything you could do as an investor I, to no no absolutely i think that the best companies i think that are the ones that i mean as all has also said i think it was very wisely said it's like you have to use everything as a startup in the startup as an opportunity like you have to realize that maybe we change our content marketing strategy maybe we like we have to plan for a long winter we just yeah. like I mean, if you raise today, like maybe I know I know companies that kind of raised a nine month run before, before, which is a very short runway, like when you're raising around. And right. I think most investors recommend people to raise 18 months. And now I think what happened is everybody raising trying to raise 24 months. So right. I think people just want more hay in the barn and more time. Um, right. So I think that's a shift. And I think that the best companies I've seen are the ones that I think they've taken it very seriously and they're thinking how to live in this new world. They made yeah. scenario planning and they furloughed people and they really work very closely with their employees. And also that's another important thing, realizing right. that like the, the people that work for you, they're also scared. So yeah, much yeah. more taking care of each other and making sure that you actually don't just look this, like don't, it's not money, it, it's really sort of, yeah, yeah. it's people and, and fear. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that, I think a big thing is people have really taken it seriously. I think because as Olga said, like corporate spending is down. I think that in yeah. the beginning, first three weeks, nobody bought anything. And then it yeah. woke up again, and then people were just very, very slow. Um, yeah. So I think that the only like, ones that are... 
these startups, I guess, are, you know, you want to be in growth mode, you want to be a happy family, you know, we're all, uh, you know, shooting for the fences, and then you get into, you know, let's say revenues disappearing, I mean, if you had some before, and mm. so on, maybe you realize, okay, how are we going to, you know, pay our rent, and I mean, that, does that change the culture in, in this in these companies or yeah i think i mean i think that the term i think that a lot of ceos that have been peacetime ceos are really badly hit and i think that the good thing i'm being ironic almost when i say this most startup ceos are wartime ceos i think most people yeah. are used to work with very kind of limited budgets and everything and having to be very agile so i think that early stage startups i, I don't know I, it's interesting to hear with yeah. stefan's perspective on later didn't have any either. revenues anyway so there was no didn't really have any revenues yes. and the ones they had they were very like doubting them i think the tricky yeah. thing is of course if you work in a market that is i think that consumer spending like consumers are like it's a scary yeah. market to be in because you don't know and actually yeah. very very heavy enterprise that all their lead types are gone i think the ones yeah. that i've seen really benefit from it is like smb SaaS. Companies that are selling remotely half front every, anyway, uh, right. because now all your customers are doing Zoom calls. All your customers right. are fine with doing it. And I think that, right. especially if you, you don't need to educate them anymore. No, and I think that if you find a strategy to actually land and expand as well, I think that's what many benefited from. Can you get two people on board right now and they slowly grow it? And I think that that's something that I think that has actually been accelerated. Um, yeah. So I think that it's tricky if you're the one that sells like $5 million licenses and you meet at yeah. the dinner at the golf course, then it's really horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I, I think it's like, it's been very uneven. And I think that's also one of the big question marks is that, which is like, like something I find very interesting. I mean, I invest in climate tech companies. I think I've actually found a lot of people wake up to thinking much more about the future. Like people right. have sort of said, oh shit, like I didn't see this coming. What else is coming? Yeah. And suddenly yeah. Yeah. So the climate crisis is sort of a sort of thing people are thinking yeah. about more. Yeah. Yeah. So Stefan, um, I guess you've been, is this your third crisis <laughs> big crisis in the career from because uh, you were there in the late uh, i mean early 2000s in the financial crisis and now this one um what's your uh, feeling and how does this uh, compare to the to the previous ones in terms of what's going on in your companies and what you have to do in terms of managing the crisis yeah, I was I was actually part of the one in in ninety two ninety three as well. Oh, so I've been been through <laughs> been through a sorry. couple. But you look so young. But, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. No, but hey, I I think that um, I mean, crises are crises are all different. So I think it it's it's really hard to uh, hard to compare them. I think in, in several of the previous crises. Oh, we're losing you a bit here, stuff. Like that, that most people, most. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, now I hear you. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So I think in, in previous crisis, uh, I think most, most actors in the market, so all, almost all companies, almost all consumers, you know, almost everyone in the value chain has been affected. I think yeah. perhaps the one thing that sticks out for me is that this time it's, it's a bit different because some companies and, and some um, some institutions etc are actually benefiting yeah. uh, and i think you know as as we've all read about the the whole tech sector with some exceptions um is is really benefiting yeah. and and as hampus you know said so many things that were going to happen have now happened in a much shorter time frame so so Kry, or Livy, which is one of our portfolio companies. Yeah. I mean, they are saying that things they thought would take 10 years to happen have now happened in two months. Yeah. So it's really an acceleration like of many online behaviors. Health, uh, online doctors, yes, right? Or online. Yeah, online, online doctors, uh, working from home, uh, yeah. selling online, you know, all these yeah. things are just accelerating. So. If I were to pick one thing, I think that's the key difference versus previous crisis. Yeah. So um, are there also um, companies where you feel, um, you know, or VC-backed companies where people say, oh, crap, that I shouldn't have done this. You know, this was like totally the wrong call to do. That's not what the future is going to be. Uh, yeah. any, any, yeah. any examples like that? Yeah. Well, that, that I mean, you don't have to all. make your own <laughs> but you know, it, <laughs> uh, that happens to us all the time, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. It's, not, it's not totally <laughs> that's, that's crisis related. Yeah, 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 but hey, yeah, yeah. I think you know 
the effect on, on portfolio companies, and Quantum has about 60 of them, is yeah. probably along a, a big scale, where you, mm-hmm. at the negative end of that scale, have a couple of companies that are in travel, right? Yeah. You know, their revenues are down anything between 95 and 100%. Yeah. So that's just, you know, it's just a terrible. Mm-hmm. Travel is usually one of the first sectors to come back, though. Mm-hmm. That might be different in this crisis. But anyway, so travel is all the way to the, to mm-hmm. the left, so to say. Actually, yes, the other... I saw some statistics from the UK who had all of a sudden, sometime in April, this huge boost in travel spending all of a sudden, like the best month yeah. in years, because at some point people thought, oh, maybe I, there will be summer vacation at all, ran and tried to get cheap tickets. So Totally. We saw that last week, actually, in a couple of companies. Anyway, then at the other end of the scale, I would say you have um, some consumer services, but, but definitely digital health. I mean, mm-hmm. digital health obviously has just exploded. That's been a core focus for us probably for, for five, six years. Mm-hmm. And then you have some sort of gray mass in the middle, uh, you know, which is yeah. some are down 20%, some are up five, et cetera. But, yeah. but the extremes yeah. are definitely travel and digital yeah. health. Yeah. Now, in, in terms of, because we heard from uh, uh, Olgan Hampus that actually startups, you know, you know, losing revenues, I mean, it's not such a big deal because you didn't have much revenues to begin with and you're used to, you know, saving every penny and, and being in kind of crisis mode is sort of the life of being a startup CEO. Do you also see that actually maybe your early stage investments somehow are doing better than your later stage investments? Or I think it's hard to just relate it to, to face because there are so many other factors that, that yeah. influence. Yeah. But I do think that startups in general are much more used to and much more prepared for mm-hmm. situations like this. Because as Hampus said, you know, it's war, it's war all the time. Yeah. Um, so I think that overall, this, this, this sector and this type of companies mm-hmm. will benefit. And I think many of our larger companies will have troubles, right? Because they are so used to working in the office. Um, they mm-hmm. are not allowed to use Zoom for mm-hmm some strange security reasons, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. Whereas startups and investors and, and the institutions that back us is much more yeah. agile. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think that's a key difference. So now uh, Natalia, who I guess have uh, maybe the most macro perspective, because Scandia, I guess, has, uh, did you say it was 50 billion stack in, uh, in the private equity, investing in private equity, something like that? Yes, in total, and one point yeah. five billion dollars in venture capital. Just yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, uh, um, and all over the world, I presume. So, what was? Uh, I guess you were you you were also in the last crisis, I guess, working uh, working uh, with private equity on the invest on the investor side. Um, is this different from uh, from last time? Okay, so yes, so I, I, th- th- this is quite interesting because I actually joined uh, the private equity team three weeks before Lehman hit. So I joined in quite in- interesting times. And at that time, we had just recently got a new mandate to speed up uh, the investments in private equity and, and venture capital. So we had, you know, a lot of capital to invest, but it was a challenging time to really find the funds because funds were... Uh, fundraisings were taken a longer time, of course. And uh, just to clarify, so I mean, we, we have 75% of the portfolio in, in, in the US and almost 25% is in, in Europe. And, uh, but we, we're trying to stay away from, or we have stayed away from, from Asia. But we, yeah. yeah, because we, we, we haven't seen that we've got the, the in, interesting returns enough. And, right. And what do I mean with that? So, I mean, over the last 10 years, our portfolio, our $1.5 billion portfolio has generated a 20% net IRR. Over the last 15 years, the number is 17%. So, um, so our, our, our strategy definitely seems seem, seem yeah. to be working and, and we have chosen to focus on these two, two, two regions. So, okay, so what's different uh, compared to last time around? So. One big difference that I see that 
companies and uh, GP seem to be more prepared this time. Mm -hmm. They have um, raised um, larger uh, financing rounds, you know, and entering the, the crisis. They, they have had, you know, overall more money on, on the company's balance sheets compared to last time around. So, I mean, obviously over the last couple of months or uh, I've been, you know, speaking with our uh, GPs in our portfolio, we have yeah. 15, 60 funds, um, over 1000 companies um, around the world. And, and, uh, and uh, well, overall cash runway seem to be 18 to 24 months, which is a fairly long period of time. And I was yeah. speaking to one growth manager who could actually survive, you know, for 30 months with their portfolio um, company. So it's that, I think that's a big change. Yeah. I think also that uh, um, GPs, including, you know, we are investors with, with Grand, and that was one of our first fund yeah. investments here, here in the Nordics, but they have been, reacting really fast also you know by cutting costs and laying off people i don't think that we really saw that maybe last time around yeah. Yeah. it was more so the crisis experience having had uh, something like this happening 10 years ago has really at least from the investors you know helped them uh, know how to react and they pull out the crisis plans from the drawer and is that your feeling well from the investment side i i think that uh well um, it's it's a fact that there were a lot of um, investors and LPs that were or become heavily overallocated and had this so-called denominator effect because of public yeah. markets were were falling. I mean, now that public markets have rebounded, it was a very short-term effect. Of course, we saw some smaller um, institutions and some smaller trusts and foundations and so on, and maybe run into liquidity problems, but yeah. in in general, um, um, institutions like Scania and, and, and others have, have had quite good financial um, mm -hmm. positions. And, and um, everyone remember, I mean, we, we have our lessons learned or, or especially the ones that kind of abandoned venture in 2008 and 2009 mm -hmm. and saw that it was quite um, difficult to enter the asset class again, at least if, right. if you wanted access to the best funds, which is kind yeah. of necessary if, if you want to invest in into venture capital. So yeah. um, so now it's definitely not the, uh, the time to stop stop investing right. In, right. In, in venture capital. It's really important to have this long-term mm -hmm. view so you don't miss the yeah. best vintage years, which tend to come around, you know, in, in crisis and, and following crisis years. So if you uh, uh, would look at um, your your venture portfolio versus your sort of buyout or later sort of private equity portfolio, um, how would you compare? Which one are you most excited about going forward? I guess maybe <laughs> the question given the topic of the panel, but you know, don't be afraid to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So or, I mean, so, is there any difference in? Uh, because we've heard quite positive signals, at least from some areas of startups, and you know, there's disruption is happening way quicker than people expected, and so on. Is that something that kind of affects your view on these asset classes? So, um, so I've I've been focusing on on venture and growth for for the last 12, 12 yeah. years. So maybe I'm a bit biased yeah. <laughs> towards the towards the asset class, but I I I I really think that. Um, Due to you know everything that's going on, and that you know Olga said and Hamper said and 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 Stefan and all the technology and disruption that that we are seeing, it's going to create you know enormous um, op opportunities, and it's uh, it's something that's uh, you know being ac accelerated now. That some of you here also also mentioned that that we are also seeing in uh, in our portfolio uh, and across portfolio companies with you know remote working and uh, and uh, digital healthcare i mean we we have a kind of you know fairly large uh, exposure to that sector especially in in the us mm -hmm. and i mean uh, having said that i'm you know i'm pretty positive <laughs> on, on buyouts as well and and uh, I think that we have a very good um, and high quality portfolio in, in in the buyout space that have been around you know before yeah. and and know how to handle you know these situations right. and that's what we've seen as well so, so to to make a long story short it's not that you're 
you know, less excited about private equity as an asset class post COVID than you were pre COVID? Is no, on, 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 on the contrary. So we haven't changed anything in our strategy or our commitment pipeline for this year or, or going forward. So we are, um, you know, still on, on, on the same track. And uh, I think that we will be ending the year having invested, um, well, almost eight, 800 million um, dollars to, um, to, to the private equity asset class. And, um, yeah, so still still committed, I would say. So um, let me um, turn to um, uh, just what, um, I mean, we do have some problems here. It sounds very rosy, uh, <laughs> this, this panel, uh, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we do have, uh, uh, we're in the middle of a, of, a, of a pretty deep recession. We're getting into, uh, you know, record high unemployment numbers. Uh, in Sweden, in the U.S., in many parts of the world, um, I guess. Do you feel if we if we go to what the government is trying to do? Um, you know, there have been various policies put in to save companies, to make it easier to lay off or temporarily furlough people, and so on. Um, do you feel these have been uh, sort of helping you? Maybe I'll start with Olga. I mean, who is actually in the startup world? Do you feel that you've uh, these? Taken, taken advantage of any of these uh, government support programs or anything like that? Do you feel, or do you feel that you know, mm. more should be done or something else should be done? Well, we've actually, uh, as I mentioned, we, we've been pretty lucky given that we are a SaaS company uh, uh, selling a digital product which is lowering companies' costs. Uh, yeah. So we've, We've been very busy this spring, yeah. and uh, we haven't uh, had the need of these uh, have government. Have hired people? Or we've, yeah, we've actually hired. Uh, oh. We've actually hired people. Oh. Um, but I've spoken to. I mean, I've spoken to a lot of peers, and uh, what I've heard from everyone who has been affected um, has been that these policies have not been tailored to. Um, smaller and this type of supports mm. have not really been tailored to smaller companies or startups. Mm. Um, I mean, a lot of startups, a lot of smaller companies use consultants, for example, or staff yeah. that pay by the hour. So this temporary uh, layoff is actually not relevant. Um, I mean, the the directed loans. Um, it's based on the. <laughs> cash flow and previous mm. revenue so it's, it's sometimes hard for, for startups to to receive these loans wow. uh, and also thirdly uh, i've heard a lot of startups struggling with this um this lack of clarity when it comes to uh, announcements of policies and rules for example in hospitality right. industry i mean i know they've been waiting and waiting and waiting for this uh, uh official policy to to be put, to be announced and, and it was announced yeah. last thursday about the yeah. traveling ban etc and of course it's yeah. hard because no one knows about this virus yeah. and how it's affecting the world but it's still, I know this, uh, these three things have been, or two things, I guess, uh, yeah. lack of, of support directly to startups or smaller companies, yeah. tailored to startups and smaller companies. And secondly, the, uh, the lack of, uh, of clear rules and, and guidance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going to let other, uh, others jump in on this issue too, in terms of uh, policy things that maybe should be done. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can jump in here. I, um, I think a couple of things were were good. Um, I think the fact that you know the government reacted quite quickly, I think was and, and really really opened the wallet, so to say. Yeah. Uh, that I think is is good, and I think on on average, you know, some of the some of the um, efforts are probably going to be good for the economy. But I think it's it's um, it's very clear that this government and, and also I would say governments of the last twenty years, yeah. they're they're adapting their policies and, and their their uh, decisions based on, 
on what I call the companies of, of yesterday yeah. uh, and not the companies of tomorrow. Uh -huh. uh, as Olga was saying, right, you know, many of these, many of these uh, policies, etc., can't really be used for for our companies, and and uh, I think here we see, you know, a big difference versus other markets, and and we're quite active in in Germany, and I think in 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 Germany, you know, there has been very forceful initiatives. I think importantly, one which is that the government has actually provided capital that mm -hmm. matches investments from the private sector and that is a key difference versus offering debt a lot yeah, of startups yeah. are used to being at war and taking on debt a lot of people know that will eventually kill you so people are just very yeah. cautious around that yeah. but if they're matching yeah. rights on raising money that's yeah. a different story so yeah. again you know we need policies for the for the companies of, of uh, you know tomorrow and not yeah. Yeah. not the, the hundred plus year old yeah. ones yeah. Only. But what about uh, the worry of governments that, well, if you just, you know, we know that uh, I don't know what 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 you have as a as a benchmark of lot what fraction of startups or let's say seed companies that you invest in do you actually expect to make it? I mean, even a successful VC investor probably, I mean, what do you say, twenty percent? Yeah, I mean, it's a definition of, of uh, you know, what, what is making it. But, you know, right. I always tell Natalia and others that probably half of the seed investments won't, won't even raise yeah. the next round. And then our operating partner always comes and says, no, 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 that's not correct. It's only, you know, 25% yeah. or so. Yeah. But, but let's say it's that, whatever, 40%, okay, that right. will anyway fail. It sounds that maybe, you know, if you're just giving away too much money too freely to these companies that anyway would fail wouldn't that be incredibly expensive for the government well i i As think that the, some... if you had a matching program that wouldn't only be for seed that should probably yeah. be for the first couple of, of phases and and yeah. uh, then it really doesn't matter i mean random does 50 50 in terms yeah. of number of investments seed and a yeah. but eventually 92 yeah. percent plus no, I look, goes yeah. into a rounds and further so i don't think it's that expensive actually no. i think we put 100 billion into furlough yeah uh, as of last week yeah sec yeah i don't I know the how first estimate you, was two uh, and a half yeah are you uh are you I, mean, I, would, of, uh, I would chime in with that and i think that i think that it's been i've seen some companies being rather good at using it i think it, but as Stefan said yeah. it's like it's very different in different geographies i think in denmark there are certain yeah. policies that have really worked i have some danish startups that invested in that have really been able to use some parts as stuff said uh -huh. some german companies has like has also been able to use them i think that there are, i think i wish that we had much more a philosophy going forward because it's always tricky to ask demand people to do stuff in history, but actually yeah. to look at what the best practices were in different countries and what really helped and make sure that we implement those. Because yeah. I think some of these policies are also maybe not as media friendly. So I mm -hmm. mean, what I mean is they're not as easy to explain to the media, which right. of course makes them not as Instagrammable. And I think yeah. that <laughs> it sometimes feel like some of these policies have to be headline simple to, to yeah. actually like drive the, the politicians where they need to be. And right. I think that some of them are complex. Um, yeah. So I think so in I, Denmark, for example, what is the, the thing that uh, they've done that maybe we should have done? But... I mean, Denmark has this uh, investment program. I think it is it is a mixed bag of investment, matching, uh, debt. I, I, I've actually not met a lot of people doing it. I think what Denmark is doing more aggressively than Sweden is doing is doing matching with um, angels. So yeah. I think some invest in Sweden has done a couple of these things. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. the Vext fund in Denmark is more aggressive yeah. on that. And they have like a list and rooster of angels that they say, if you invest, we're going to pair up and, and be beneficial for the angels as well. So essentially asking angels to take more risk and, right. and slightly supported by government money. I think that is, that is an interesting idea. I think that, I think Sweden is doing it, but they're doing it through accelerators more. Yeah. So I think they're doing it less with angels and more through accelerators. Um, I think one thing interesting I find is also on the government level is that Germany, for example, has been very clear that a lot of the investments they do, not in startups now, now I mean the public markets, is that a lot of the infrastructure investments have been very focused on being green. So making yeah. sure that if you build new stuff, then you actually build them thinking about there's another crisis coming. 
And uh -huh. I know that I'm sort of, I know this is my agenda here, but yeah. I think that it's interesting yeah. with the governments who don't. Um, yeah. I think that there's, I think we can all agree that people will fly in the future. Uh, so like, it's, yeah. I'm not saying that we shouldn't support airlines at all, but I think it's tricky yeah. when you have governments who essentially think very short term and say that this is a job we had in the 1950s, yeah. we probably need that for a job for the future. Instead right. of saying, we're gonna back, we're gonna put an enormous amount of subsidies, but we need those subsidies to be working long-term, not just COVID, yeah. not just equality, not just information wars, yeah. but also climate. I think we have multiple crises. I mean, we're seeing, yeah. we're seeing now a pandemic, but I think if um, the crisis I'm worried about is actually the information war. The fact right. that you cannot trust information anymore. Right. I, I don't know how many calls I've had with friends over the last 10 weeks where people have been saying, how are things going in Sweden? It feels like it's yeah. uh it's crazy and it's like yeah. i look out it's like yeah. it's actually not as it seems on american news yeah, exactly. um and i think that i think that's the thing i worry it's like it feels that this crisis just it just showed two things for me that i fear apart from climate one is that it's yeah. very hard to trust information it's very quickly being weaponized and used very partisan um yeah. and the second thing is inequality i think that the, the black Lives matter movement in the us i think that yeah. what happened the last weeks i think it's it's something I think that everybody's seen it's coming, right? It's yeah. like we have a very unequal world. And I think yeah. that that's one of my biggest fears is that those things yeah. make it very hard to build a good system. And right. I think that, I mean, George Floyd, that was not yeah. the first and that was not the last instance. It was just like yeah. you had it at a time when there was record high unemployment rate. People were yeah. supposed to stay home and not do anything. People were afraid about the future. And these yeah. things, it's just the thing that makes people, it's the kindling. Yeah. And I think that that's, I think that this is the first of multiple crises. And I think that we have to learn. That's what I meant with governments. I want us to have a more systemic approach and not as much just go, okay, let's sort of prop this up. Um, yeah. I mean, what yeah, happens in the fall? What I mean, what's going to happen in Q3, Q4? What's going right. to happen in Q3, Q4 when a lot of governments are going to say, okay, so like no more furlough st stipends. Uh, yeah. what, what's going to happen when the unemployment rates actually hits the uh, housing markets? Like, you know, economically, yeah. I mean, yeah. nobody knows i think that we just and i'm not saying doomsday i'm saying yeah. okay let's sort of plan and think yeah. i think there are a couple of uh, interesting things you're bringing up here um um and and one of them i guess is is uh, esg which uh, you know has been an increasing focus for um, both for firms and for investors and for lps uh, now one of the i remember one of the first things I was thinking about when the crisis hit is like, okay, now we're really going to see whether ESG is like a bull market luxury thing that you do because things are going well and let's be nice. And then when the crisis hits now, okay, now let's, now we don't have time for, uh, and, 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 and money for this kind of stuff. Now we need to focus on making money, you know, surviving versus the opposite, you know, this being somehow, oh, we realize this crisis, we, you know, see that there are other things, crisis happening, and it's more important to to be sustainable. Maybe I, I, if I ask Natalia, because you're sort of from the investor side, and I suppose that Scandia has been thinking, you know, about the ESG in your in, in your investments. And yeah. So, and I mean, this is clearly very important for us, and and we are implementing this not only, you know, in 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 private equity across the entire Scania and, 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 and the entire portfolio. And I think that we've been uh, approaching and addressing this for, for quite some time, at least eight, eight years, I, I, I would dare to say. But I mean, go, going back to your question, I mean, and I think this is really interesting because um, since the, I mean, the demand for the top T funds and the top groups is still so high so we are clear we are seeing you know if, if, even though things are slowing down you know the fundraising markets are slowing down the top key groups are you know still being raised in two to three months it's they're being oversubscribed so many lps really don't want to you know um address uh, those things too much because in in the us it's less important, actually. I mean, I think that we as European investors, and I've seen that from a lot of Swedish investors, that we are more focused on this. And I mean, uh -huh. we, we are continuing to, to, to drive or, you know, f those questions or, uh, yeah, and, and, and focus on that. But yeah. I'm not sure that that will actually, you know, increase uh, now. Yeah. 
bit yeah. unsure, but uh, time yeah. time will tell. Yeah, I mean Olga, from a from a company um, point of view, as as sort of a, is this something that you um, you put a lot of emphasis on? Maybe this sounds like now like a leading question, but you know, what's what's your do you have? Um, uh, is it important to to run a sustainable startup? You think, uh, and 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 why? In that sense, in terms of ESG and things like that. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, it's kind of uh, it's an uh, almost obvious thing today. Uh, yeah. It's not even something you you think about uh, or consider. But you, but you're not. But do you feel like okay? So all of these, you know, uh, um, nice things we did, uh, um, you know, kind of charitable things. Well, now we have to think about uh, saving money, so <laughs> we can't. Yeah, no, of course. I mean. Uh, of course, it's a different climate now, and you think about your runway and and cutting costs and saving money. Um, but I have to say, I mean, uh, in a way, um, I, I actually wanted to comment on it earlier when we spoke yeah. about the um, wartime CEO yeah. of of yeah. Uh, startups. Uh, yeah. And I I would like to challenge that picture a bit because I think if you look at at least Sweden and Stockholm a year ago. Or just this autumn, I mean, access to uh, venture capital and and to capital has been has been quite quite great, and uh, yeah. a lot of startups and companies have quite easily been able to to get access to yeah. quite a lot of money, uh, yeah. which means that a lot of companies have not spent money in a sustainable way. Right. You know, they've just hired uh, lots and lots of people and. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just done things yeah. without really thinking it through, maybe, and uh-huh. you know, not being not being sustainable in their way of spending yeah. money. So, yeah. Yeah. in a way, this crisis is also forcing companies to become more sustainable when it comes to spending. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the first thing. And then, secondly, I think also, I mean, it's not directly tied to the ESG, but um, you've seen in the crisis this enormous response. Uh, of support from other companies and Mm -hmm. this feeling of a community and Mm -hmm. really wanting to help out so although you might not be like pushing for things that you uh, afforded to to invest in or do as a company before when you had uh, you know a better cash flow uh, you're supporting the community in in different ways Mm -hmm. Uh, oh. All these initiatives. That, that's very interesting because it's yeah. not like obvious that that would happen, right? You could say that okay, if it's about survival, it's like yeah. every man and woman for her own, you know. Exactly, um, but it's been the opposite here in Stockholm, and uh, I mean, we and all other startups have been involved in different ways to help each other. Um, so it's been a different type of uh-huh. of community and uh, yeah, community support, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think the general, I think sorry, yeah, sorry, I, was just gonna, I was just gonna say I think generally the thing that makes me very hopeful is really that I feel feel that I mean I've been an entrepreneur and investor since two thousand and one, and I think that when you meet the new crop or a new whatever you want to say the new um, cohort of entrepreneurs every year at whatever you're how you're meeting them, I think what I've felt is that the number of people who care about the collective we it feels like it's just doubling every year. I, I, I feel like I, the thing that makes me hopeful is essentially is that the younger people are, the more they really care about the world. And I think that, I'm not saying that other people don't, but I think it's really amazing yeah. to feel like um, a lot of startups have, they're thinking so much about having a sustainable collective we. And I'm not just talking about ecological sustainability. I think also, as August saying, also like a mental sustainability. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. like pe- yeah. people are really taking care of each other much more. And I think that when I found that I met entrepreneurs 10 years ago, and I think, that's, I mean, it's, this is a normal distribution, right? You have all kinds of people. But I get very hopeful to see that people really, in these, I think in a crisis also, this crisis sparks the thing of purpose much more. I think people don't want to start a startup now. They feel that, it, it's sometimes hard to remember that realizing Greta Thunberg wasn't a thing two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now it's like ingrained into kind of our country's soul as at the level of Ikea. And I think yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting to remember that the, this, it's not that old of a movement, but it's really accelerated. Mm-hmm. And if you think about how many friends you had at dinner uh, last month that have said that they would prefer vegetarian food versus five years ago versus 15 years right. ago, 
Um, and I think that this it is happening. I think that this crisis also gets people to sort of, I hope at least, it gets people to just think about the future slightly more. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think that sometimes I think, I think that we are, we, you must have five time zones uh, mm -hmm. in our mind. Like we have the long history, we have yesterday, we have now, we have tomorrow, and we have the long future. And I think what, what the, most of us sadly live in yesterday and tomorrow, as in, mm. oh no, I shouldn't have written that thing, and tomorrow I'm gonna have this presentation. <laughs> but I think that these crises spark people usually to think about the long history. Like, there are oh. so many people that have compared this to the, I mean, the Spanish influenza, which is, we shouldn't call it Spanish, like yeah. that was not where it came from. And yeah. a lot of people are thinking about the long future. So people are catapulted into these two new time zones. And I think that that is very useful because we sort of think yeah. about this, 2020 is not the last or the first year in history, even if the Mayan civilization thought it was the last. Right. I mean, Stefan, uh, do you feel, because uh, I, I guess you as a, as a, you know, when you raise money from LPs, I guess have over the last um, five, 10 years seen that, that ESG seen the higher and higher on, on investors' agendas and so on. Um, um, how, how do you feel this going forward? Do you also agree that this is not, uh, this crisis is not going to be, uh, you know, two steps back in that? Uh, or Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I think that's correct. I don't, you know, there, I don't think there's a, there's no going back from the trend that has started in, in all the areas that have, that have been mentioned here. But, but I also think that there are, you know, big differences across different geographies and, and, you know, Stockholm is and, and Sweden is one ecosystem, but there, mm -hmm. there are many more out there. And actually there are more and more startup mm -hmm. ecosystems mm -hmm. around the world. And, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, the one we live in is not the biggest one, uh, mm -hmm. but it's starting to become one of the more mature ones. If mm -hmm. we exclude, you know, the Valley or maybe parts of the East coast in, in the U S and, mm -hmm. and therefore you know, these, these trends become more, prominent mm -hmm. in, in more mature mm -hmm. ecosystems. I think if you go to some other ecosystems across Europe, I think these uh, trends are not as prominent as, as they are here, but they but will come. The US and, and I don't think this firm, is going to I, re I, I, I realize that, you know, I mean, you're, you're a fairly large uh, fund by now, but a lot of VC funds are fairly small. And when they get, you know, they try to raise money and then these, uh, you know, Natalia and, and other LPs are like, okay, can you fill out this long ESG questionnaire and answer how you deal with ESG issues in your investments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I guess that's, uh, I've heard at least, you know, that might not be something that every uh, GP enjoys immensely or, you know. Well, hey, I, you know, this is, probably different, but I think, you know, it's, it's like everything, you have to play it smart. And, and if it's really hard to get into a GP, and as Natalia mentioned, I think we're seeing a, a bifurcation and polarization in the market, both when it comes to, to GPs, so, so VC firms, mm -hmm. but also startups, right? Um, mm -hmm. If it's hard to get in, maybe this is not the first thing you bring up, but once you're on board, then you can start to work it. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm stealing your thunder, Natalia, but that's at least how I, how I would, yeah. how I would. But do you think there are, uh, there are sort of uh, um, uh, ventures that uh, would have had a relatively easy time getting funding, let's say 10 years ago, that now no one would invest in simply due to kind of ESG type concerns? The odd one. But I don't think that's a... Or, you, a know, um, you start, oh, I have this great uh, uh, online uh, casino thing where I can hook people up so they play, you know, way more <laughs> on the casino or something. I mean... Yeah, make but I think that, that's, that's actually something that... That's an area that the VC industry at large hasn't mm -hmm. really touched for a long okay. time. And, and much of that is actually due to LPs because they have had as um, demands that you should not touch guns, arms, tobacco, alcohol, betting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but I also think that a lot of, I mean, a lot of startups are not successful unless they use resources more efficient. Mm -hmm. I mean, there needs to be a key reason why someone changes to your product or your service. Mm -hmm. And that often goes hand, not always, but that often goes hand in hand 
mm-hmm. by doing things that are you know relatively mm-hmm. good, mm-hmm. so to say. Mm-hmm. Hampus, would you would you agree agree to that? Because you're more into that sector than yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say that it's much, much cheaper to run a sustainable company in the crazy way that uh, you get much bigger talent pool and mm-hmm. people are. People are happy to leave their oil and gas job for you for a slightly lower salary. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'm joking aside, but I, I really see that. I think that mm-hmm. companies that where there is a strong purpose, I think that there is a, you know, you get more media attention. People think it's more interesting to talk about them. People would rather brag about them at parties. Investors rather brag about them, of course. Like, I think that you just, I think you have this as a benefit. I think that it's, I think that it takes longer time uh, to build these companies slightly longer time because sometimes you have to think more uh you can't just blitz scale and ignore certain things but i'm not saying it takes twice as long time there's some kind of additive uh, uh cost of that but i think the biggest part is just the the discount of it i invested in a couple of as, as stefan is saying also the remote health and i've invested in a couple of on um, mental health and sexual health and those companies have like they can hire anybody they want i think it's it's crazy to see how they just say, we want this person and they left this company for us. And I feel like, how did you get that person? Oh, they were tired of their blue color, like, you know, this our blue chip, like super impressive mm-hmm. firm. They wanted mm-hmm. to join something with a purpose. Mm-hmm. So I definitely agree to you, Stefan. So I, I just want to uh, 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 pinch in here that if anyone uh, of our attendees have, uh, have any uh, question you would like to pose, you can use the Q&A uh, window. Uh, I think we might have a few minutes here to, to answer some questions. But uh, before we do that, I just want to maybe, uh, as a boring finance person, ask a little bit about returns and valuations, because I, I guess we've been coming from a, a, you know a long period with increasing you know more and more capital uh, interested in private equity uh, in general and venture capital maybe in particular, you know increasing valuations. We've had uh, the Vision Fund, uh, you know one and maybe two, you know with. Uh, uh, you know, ridiculous amounts of money being sprayed at uh, at uh, startups and and and, uh, and young companies. Do you think um, this crisis has changed or stopped this trend, um, or do you think it's sort of rebounding uh, uh, very quickly? Or you know, do you, and I guess that will have implications. Do you think returns for for uh, venture capital funds are going to look? great or not so great i guess uh in the 2000 you know let's say 19 18 19 vintages i don't know and anyone has any thoughts on that uh maybe natalia if we start with you i guess you are seeing your marks from your various investments uh. so I, I i think i'll just you know start with saying that it's um it's kind of important to remember that um some of the you know most disruptive and uh, notable companies that we have in our life today were actually started um, and founded during the crisis years uh, after the financial crisis. Let's take Uber, for example. I mean, one of the huge successes in, 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 in modern times, Inventure seeded and founded in 2009. Lyft was also founded and seeded in that time. Slack was founded in 2009. Pinterest was founded at that time, and um, and um, and that's important to 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 remember. I mean, another company, you know, who I mean, it was founded before the crisis, but you know, founded or or, or uh, funded by uh, by Crandom and Stefan in 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 2008. Uh, also, huge success, and it's quite interesting because I I remember at that time there were many. VCs that turned uh, Spotify down, didn't want to invest because they had, you know, they thought the valuation was too high. They didn't think that this was going to to happen because of the label records. And there were some GPs who had uh, had uh, um, negative experiences from investing into the music sector who turned the company down. So. It's uh, it's 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 important to, to to remember that, and from these companies, I mean, they have generated enormous returns for 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 LPs who had who have been you know lucky or successful uh, enough to be in this in these uh, companies and in and in these funds, of course. So, um, I mean, just Uber and Spotify. I mean, these two companies together 
and we had you know exposure in not only one fund but in 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 two funds uh, fr from these companies they returned almost 15 percent of the entire venture portfolio oh. scania's venture portfolio one five 15 percent which is kind of, i mean and that's what's remarkable why did about you invest the in the other model. company <laughs> so, uh, well, but what 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 about um, uh, I mean valuations? Then I mean, do you worry about um, um, your your funds having invested in in some companies with super high valuations? You know, in the top of the kind of we work uh, type hype, and now uh, they're gonna you're gonna see more modest returns. Yes, Yes, of course. I mean, we, we, I mean, that part of the portfolio, which is roughly 50%, which is kind of in, in, in the later stages. Of course, we have seen some um, valuation hits um, in those companies. And that's, uh, I mean, to some extent driven by, by market uh, valuations because they are using, you know, market-based valuations and in some in, in instances it's company specific you know they've been hit by 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 the crisis but i mean there are some companies that are you know gaining from from the yeah. from the crisis so i'm i would like to say that it's very company specific and that worries me maybe a little bit on 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 the later stage but not on the mm. Yeah. With, with the rest of the 50 percent of of the portfolio that, that right. i feel more more comfortable about right. I mean, I guess maybe I'm going to ask uh, um, the the investors here, to Hampus and uh, and Stefan. I mean, do you uh, do you feel that uh, this crisis is ultimately going to be bad for returns or good for returns or irrelevant? Uh, I, I can start. I think that I mean, you have to look at returns in a 10 to 15 year perspective uh, and not get hung up on you know how how certain metric changes from from perhaps one year to the other or or even more one quarter to the other mm -hmm. obviously short term i think we're seeing uh, write downs in in a lot of portfolios whether it your growth etc uh, but if you take the right perspective and you know the perspective that someone like Scandia has, I think you guys have been doing this since 1982. I mean, that's the way to get returns. Mm. Then I don't think it matters that much. It could actually be beneficial um, because if you are both a GP or an LP, you can get into companies that were, or, G, or firms that were harder to get into mm. to otherwise. Um, as a venture investor, an early stage investor, the the price at investment is not that critical mm -hmm. it's only what you can make of it in the end or what the entrepreneurs mm -hmm. can make of it in the end mm -hmm. and i think it's it's even so extreme that venture is not really about vintages or type of companies etc it's about like five companies a year mm -hmm. that's what it's about right right if you were in Uber and, and Lyft in the 2006 to 2008 vintages, that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you were in Spotify, in iSettle, in Elastic, in Adyen, in European tech, that's it. That's yeah. where you have to be. So it's a super concentrated outcome at the end of the day. So it's all about being in the right companies and not investing. Yeah you know 10 percent cheaper or something right actually just to uh, uh, on that note there is some recent uh, evidence trying to understand you know what drives venture capital returns um and it seems to be quite different drivers i guess what you're alluding to to let's say buyout returns which are much more price driven and so on um, and one of the interesting findings is that you can divide periods where if you look at how take all the companies in the stock exchange and some do well and some do badly okay in a given year if you look at the spread between the worst performing and the best performing companies in the stock market you know you think about that volatility if you will periods where that volatility is unusually high vc does really well <laughs> so i guess it's what we're saying is that there's periods when there's like some companies going to hell and some companies 
benefiting a lot. Those are periods where venture actually seems to, to do well, which I guess is sort of maybe alluding to, uh, you know, periods of disruption and then the few winners that are going to be immensely successful. That's where a good venture capitalist can make a lot of money. But it's not I enough to invest in those periods. You yeah. have to be in the winners, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I would say, I mean, venture is a power locker, right? So it is that if you're in the head of the power locker, that's it. Nothing else really matters. And I think that that's, I think it's that also means that at seed stage or even at A round, if you're paying even crazily enough, like 50% too high, if you're in, if you're in the head, that does yeah. not matter. Um, yeah. It matters in the body. And uh, that's yeah. where it really matters. But the thing is, those are, yeah, those are like, you know, you get a 2x return or you get a 2.3x return. But right. if you're looking at getting a 50x return or a 45x or whatever, I mean, then sort of you're all, you're doing you're doing well. I think that yeah. I think that generally I think that times, as you said, when the volatility is high, that is I think that when newness has a big value. I think that when we're in a time, I mean, big companies are really good at being very homogene about their thinking. They, yeah. they, they, they sort of build a machine and everything is aligned and they do things the exact same way. And I mean, if you build a machine that is supposed to hit in nails with a hammer, well, you're yeah. going to be great at doing that. And then somebody comes with yeah. a screw and says, can we change to do this? You're toast. Yeah. And these yeah. kind of disruptive periods when stuff changes, that's when people yeah. just come in with like 50 different screws and you don't know which one's going to work. And then yeah. if you're a very big firm, you stand there with a hammer. And the yeah. cool thing about startups is that they come in and they say, let me look at the thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, the power of, of working as a like disruptive uh, like industry is like yeah. you you thrive when you have a yeah. crooked road when there's a highway the yeah. big corps win yeah. Yeah. So, I mean I'm gonna end that uh, we, we have just a few uh, uh, two minutes left I guess but uh, Olga you know and maybe this is relating to this you know what uh, what on earth would make you start the company i mean it seems like you know 50 percent are gonna fail there's huge uncertainty there's disruption there's this and that uh, why didn't you stay at uh, mckinsey <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well actually i have to i have to tie back to hampus uh, comment earlier about i mean maybe i'm not really part of that generation but i guess i'm kind of on the uh, boundary but but it's very much about purpose today. Um, I mean, you want to have a purpose and by starting a company through which you feel you can achieve and create something that makes the world a better place in different ways, if that can be cutting costs for other companies or whatever, uh, but having a positive impact, uh, mm. uh, that was much higher than uh, staying at a big corporation um, mm. where things, uh, Aren't you afraid about uh, failure? Because even realistically, if you execute uh, everything perfectly and so on, who knows whether this thing is going to fly or not? Uh, this, I don't know. It's also something about right now. That's, it's a very, it's a magic time, I would say, in, especially in Stockholm, but also in Sweden right now. And I felt when I took the decision uh, almost two years ago to, to leave McKinsey to start my own company, uh, part of this, the reason for making that decision was that I felt um, this uh, startup ecosystem, that's, it's vibrating. Um, there's so much innovation, there's so much stuff going on. And mm -hmm. if, you know, if I don't do this now, I'm gonna regret, I'm gonna look back at it and be like, mm -hmm. why did I not just take the risk and throw myself out there? And I also think, I, I don't think, I mean, Living in a country like Sweden, I mean, there's a lot of uh, hypothesis around why why has there been so many successful startups in Sweden. Well, we do have a safe system, right? Mm. Welfare system, and and it's mm. it's a safe environment. So mm. people in my generation, they're not that scared or afraid. Um, mm. I mean, my parents' reaction to to making this decision was very much different from my my friend's reaction yeah, yeah. to making this decision. Um, so the fear is not really there. The fear of failure is not there. That's very inspiring. Maybe I should quit my job. And <laughs> you should. Um, so I think we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, but I want to thank uh, all the panelists. It's been uh, a very interesting uh, and super uh, 
inspiring discussion today and I leave with a bit of hope in this uh, uh, somewhat dismal time we we're living in. So thanks a lot and uh, and thank you. thanks everyone for listening in. And bye bye. Thanks. Thank you guys. Bye. Thanks.